How are you, Mark? I'm good. I'm good. I greatly appreciate your doing this. I've read sure. your book. Uh, oh. Not that you really care, but it's, and, and you know, I'll say, these things, biographies by members of Congress and such are usually very boring. Yours is not boring. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fantastic. I mean, really, I was riveted. It was really good. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You know, I wrote it um, not to be a political biography, autobiography. I, I wrote it um, particularly for young women, actually. Although, if you look on Amazon to see where the 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 uh, demographics are, you know, women over 50 are the ones that are reading it in the biggest numbers, but- um, Women over 50, is that right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. well. Uh, but, um, or maybe 45, whatever it's, but you know, older women, but I wrote it for younger women because I wanted them to appreciate that, you, you know, lots of these things happen to all of us and you can overcome it and really um, survive and thrive. Not all these things happen to, <laughs> Some of these things happen. And, and again, this is why, and that's why I'm fascinated by it. And I mean, I appreciate your being as open as you are about it, because I mean, the people who will be with us tonight, and we'll get started in just a minute, many more women do this program than men. It's like mm -hmm. two to one, which it's the same thing with study abroad. I don't know if women are more willing to take chances when they're in college, um, but that's the way it is. It's always been two to one women, which is interesting. Well, it's, it's a, you know, they're drawn to public service, I think, um, which doesn't always carry with it a, you know, a fat salary, uh, or most of the time doesn't carry a fat salary, right? Yeah, um, no, that's, that's sadly true. So, um, um, it'd be nice for me if we could just have them, you know, give one minute about who they are. I mean, because we have a whole hour. Do we have Yeah, but there's going to be two minutes. I'll tell you what, I'll have them if, so the way this has to work is, um, I'll ask questions for a little bit and then okay. I'll turn it over to them. We, when they're willing to, will unmute them. And if they're okay with it, they'll go on camera. And then we yep. can ask them as they're asking questions to do okay. that. Okay. I mean, it's too All many right. people to have everybody do that right away, which is. Which How is many good. are there? Um, right now we're at um, 34, but it's growing. It's growing. And now is it growing, but also a lot of people, we record this, if that's okay with you. And then. Sure. People, people watch this later. We end up having a lot of attendance afterwards, but, but already the numbers, yeah, it's gonna grow and grow. So are we ready to get started? The folks who are- We are ready to go. Okay, and um, people are all on. Excellent, all right, let's get going. Um, as I try to call up my screen here. Um, all right, welcome everybody. Um, we are thrilled to have uh, Congresswoman Jackie Spear with us today. Uh, the Congresswoman represents California's 14th Congressional District, which is basically the southwest corner of San Francisco and most of San Mateo County. She's got a remarkable biography and life story. And I'm just going to sort of rattle off some of them. I'm going to go backwards and then I'll ask questions for a little bit, but most of the hour are for your questions. So I'll, please get ready to ask questions. Uh, the way to do it is to stick them in the chat box or, or I'm sorry, the Q&A box, probably either one. And then we will call you and we'll unmute you and you can ask the Congresswoman directly questions. So, so our uh, as I say, she has a remarkable life story. Congresswoman Spears, she's been in Congress since 2008. She's been on the forefront of uh, women's right, rights, the, the, women, uh, the Me Too movement, bringing it to Congress, LGBTQ rights, um, environmental issues. She was at the Capitol on January 6th in the House Gallery when it was under attack, which we'll certainly talk to her about. She spent 18 years in the California legislature, 10 in the assembly and eight in the Senate six years on the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors. She was with Representative Leo Ryan when he was a congressman representing essentially the district she represents now um, when he was murdered by deputies of Jim Jones, uh, who was running the Jonestown cult down in South America in Guyana. Uh, Congresswoman Spear was a staffer. She escaped after getting shot five times. By, uh, a, a, by, by crawling into uh, a section of the air of a small airplane that was there and eventually hiding out in the jungle for 22 hours before rescuers came. Clearly we'll talk about that some. She attended UC Davis where yes. among other things, she interned for Congressman Ryan. 
and she got her start in politics, I believe if I have this right, as a Ryan girl, where you thought you were maybe going to do political work and instead they had you dress up and go out and almost cheerlead for the congressman. He wasn't a congressman at that point. He was a um, in the state legislature. Um, so, so there are so many things to talk about. And, um, but I want to start with something on the lighter side because much of this stuff is not light. Um, Congresswoman wrote this book, Undaunted, which as I was just saying to her, and, and I mean this sincerely, many books by members of Congress are hideously dull. Um, I think it's fair to say that this does not have a dull moment in it. It is riveting. Um, some of the stories in here are, are remarkable, but I want to ask you about something that probably isn't the most obvious thing. You said that you uh, that you learned judo, and you said <laughs> it's a good thing. You said the only time I had the opportunity to use judo skills was decades later, um, when I flipped Stephen Colbert twice after we skateboarded through the halls of the Capitol for the Colbert Report. Okay, that's it for the explanation <laughs> of that. So what? So it was a, a segment he was doing at the time called Know Your District. And so, you know, he brings members on, embarrasses them, and then asks them to do crazy things. And so I went on his show and uh, he said, Can, you know, will, we, will you skateboard down the Cannon House um, hallway? And I said, sure. And that's what we did. And then he says, all right, you know judo. So come on, throw me. So I took that $2,000 suit and threw him onto the floor. Now, the funny part of it is that it never got aired. That was left on the cutting room floor. Um, and uh, so just very recently, I did his show again. Uh, now it's a different format, of course. And uh, he was doing Billy Crystal in the first segment and then me, and there was gonna be two segments. And in the second one, he was gonna show the video and they and then suggest that maybe I should take a job with the Capitol Police. Um, this is after January. Did they show the video? They didn't because uh, Billy Crystal's interview went longer, and so my segment was only uh, one segment. So it's still never seen, um, you know, the the light of day. Okay. Although it's on YouTube, if you really want to find it. <laughs> okay, that sounds uh, interesting. All right, so you were on Colbert just a couple weeks ago, and uh, and you talked about what happened to you on January 6th. So describe to us what, where you were during the insurrection and what went through your head. So I was in the gallery um, of the house because I wanted to observe what is you know, routinely done every four years. It's ceremonial where the uh, electoral votes are counted. And I wanted to come early because California is early in the alphabet. And so I wanted to be there for that. And uh, I remember thinking, it was pretty bizarre that we had a US Senator from Texas, uh, Cruz, and he was objecting to the vote that took place in Arizona. You know, what's wrong with that picture? So they were in the middle of the debate on uh, overturning the electoral college vote in Arizona. And then I saw the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, walk somewhat um, with a you know, sense of determination off the House floor. And she always looks like she's determined. So that didn't um, you know, mean that much to me. But then a few minutes later, Steny Hoyer, who was the majority whip, was escorted off the floor. And then I knew something was happening. And I had looked at my Twitter feed and had seen that they were able to, they were wrestling with Capitol Police. But I, I assumed that everything was under control. We've had demonstrations on Capitol Hill for decades. And you know, even during the Tea Party period, it, was always under control. Uh, then a, a, a police officer from uh, the Capitol Police got up at the dais and said, uh, the Capitol has been breached and we were all a little um, concerned, but still it had not reached the, um, the sense of urgency. And then he said to us, there's a pouch underneath your seat. Now I've sat in the Capitol gallery hundreds of times. Um, I never knew there were pouches under the seats, but he says, take the pouch out. It was a canvas bag. I unzipped it. I'm trembling a little bit. I take out this um, kind of aluminum covered packet, told to rip it open and out pops a gas mask. And then he said, don't put it on yet. Then he says, 
uh, all of you should move to the other side and you had to crawl under the brass railings because they're separated. And uh, so it, you know, it was difficult to do, but we all kind of moved to the other side. And there were probably about 30 of us in the gallery. Meanwhile, all of the members that were on the floor had been evacuated. There was- so the gallery, wait, just so people understand, the gallery is the part, there's the floor, the gallery is the part that spectators or the media are in usually to look down, right? Correct. And okay. they had locked all of the gallery doors. So there was, you know, we were, we were stuck there. And so as we moved to the other side, uh, holding our gas masks, uh, we were then um, told to, you know, get down. And there was pounding going on on the doors of the house chamber. And then the, um, the Capitol Police and Sergeant of Arms put a huge piece of furniture up against the door. I mean, then you really know there's something serious. They drew their guns and had them pointed at the um, rioters. And as I was lying there, all of a sudden there was a, a gunshot. And I thought, oh my God. And it took me back in time, some 43 years when I was lying on that airstrip um, and they came and shot us at point blank range. So I, I put my, my cheek down on the side of that marble that was really cold. And I thought, I, I, I don't believe this. I mean, I survived you know, death in the jungles of Guyana uh, away from civilization. And here I am in this temple of, of democracy in my country and I'm about to die again. So it was um, very traumatic uh, for all of us. And you, eventually you, we were- you, you thought that this was definitely possibly going to be the end. I mean, this, it was that traumatic at that point. Well, yeah, once there were gunshots then, because we had no idea what they had. Um, but of course we found out that they, they used clubs and flags and pipes um, to beat up on the, uh, the police officers and so eventually they um they wanted us to exit and there was pounding you know going on on the doors and we said you know wait a minute they said by that point the rioters had breached the third floor of the capitol and um, eventually we did exit that door and as i turned to my right on the floor are the rioters a group of six or eight of them with Capitol Police officers and their assault weapons pointed at them. So then we um, scurried down many flights of stairs to get to a secure location where we spent the next four or five hours. Um, Do you feel safe when you go there now? Uh, well, I, I guess you do feel safe right now because you know it's, it's lined with uh, 5,000 National Guardsmen um, with a huge fence. But that's not our capital. That should not be what we are witnessing. But I think for the foreseeable future, um, we're going to need those kinds of safety precautions. The speaker has asked uh, former General Honoré, Russell Honoré, to do an investigation and look at safety concerns. We're going to have to you know, really um, put some serious constraints in place because what, what that uh, I think made everyone in the world who wants to do us harm realize that we were pretty penetrable. Um, that, um, it, it, you know, just like the planes flying over, um, you know, 9-11 and headed towards uh, the Pentagon and the Capitol before, I mean, it, it, um, it, it, was, it was frightening how easy it was for them to overtake the Capitol Police. So, I mean, you were, you were certainly the only one in the Capitol at that point, and maybe one of the, maybe the only person in the country going through that, who, who had witnessed a member of Congress being murdered, who shot repeatedly. What they shot, they shot Representative Ryan 45 times. Is that right? Yes. Um, it must have, um, it, it certainly took the United States, and I'm sure for you even longer after that incident, 
to think that the world was a normal and safe place. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering whether or not, if you look at this incident, you think that maybe a year from now when we're not wearing masks and we have interns back at the Capitol and such, uh, that, that, that things will be back to normal or how much are you afraid that this may be the new normal in Washington? Mark, I must say I'm, I'm uh, concerned that until we get a handle on the violent extremism going on in our country, you know, we're so focused on, on foreign actors, but we have a problem right here in this country. So far of those who have been arrested and charged, um, 13 of them are associated with QAnon, 15 of them are associated with the Proud Boys, four of them are associated with the Oath Keepers, and then another 14 of them, or 14% of them, were either former military or police. So uh, there is a, a sense of um, uh, hatred and um, uh, dislike for government that has been really fomented by former President Trump. I, I, I think he knew exactly who he was dealing with and they enjoyed being a part of his uh, entourage because it was amplifying um, their presence and helping them with recruitment. So these were a group of anarchists, white supremacists and uh, anti-Semites. And that's a toxic group. And you have legislation to try to to try to weed this out of the military. Um, how right. would that work? And does anybody oppose that? You know, um, a year ago, actually, I held a hearing on violent extremism within the military. And um, I was appalled at um, what I heard. One of which was, I mean, a, a, an actual non-commissioned officer within the army who was a member of a group called Identity Europa, I believe, uh, a white supremacist group was identified as such, was allowed to stay in the military even though he was active in the organization and recruiting and fundraising. And he was just lower to rank. Now, after we had the hearing and we exposed that um, set of scenario, he was in fact separated. But it underscored for me the fact that we needed a section in the Uniform Code of Military Justice on violent extremism. Interesting, interestingly enough, it gets through the house and the Department of Defense was interested in having it as a new crime in the code, but the President of the United States, Donald Trump, and the Senate uh, did not. And so it was taken out of the National Defense Authorization Act uh, in December. But I'm very confident we'll be able to move it uh, this year. All right, let me uh, switch topics so we can get to student questions as soon as possible. Um, this is not much happier of a topic, um, but um, let's talk about Me Too for a moment. If I understand this right, um, I mean, you, I know you introduced legislation to change this, but before you introduced this legislation, just a few years ago, if you were sexually assaulted as a staffer or somebody by a member of Congress or by their chief of staff, um, as an accuser, first you have to spend 30 days in counseling, then you, have to, then you have to spend 30 days in mediation with your accused attacker, then you have to wait another 30 days, but not longer than 90 days to file a complaint. That's correct. This was in the 2000s this was going on. This was so, going so on as recently as 2015 and 16. And what makes it even more egregious is the fact that when there was a settlement, it was not the member of Congress picking up the tab, it was the taxpayers of this country. Okay, so what, um, um, and, and you've been very open about this in your book, as a much younger woman uh, working in a congressional office, you were assaulted. Yes, I was, it was a one-time event um, and it you know, was the, the chief of staff in the congressional office who, when we were working late one night, you know, pushed me up against the wall and stuck his tongue down my throat. Um, and I just made sure I was never alone with him uh, again. Uh, but I told that story when I did because I wanted to make sure that, me, that the staff within the Capitol knew that I had their backs and that I had experienced it myself and that I wanted to fix it. So we did fix it. No longer are they 
um, required to have non-disclosure agreements. They don't have to go through that 30 days, 30 days, 30 days. Um, they can um, file a complaint. They are actually provided counsel, which was not the case before. So there is legal counsel representing them and um, the member is responsible for uh, any settlement costs. And this is the kicker. And if they can't pay it within 180 days, uh, then they, it will be paid by the federal government, but they will have their um, salary uh, charged. So it, it will be, um, the money will be taken out of their salary. If that's not sufficient, it will be taken out of their, uh, what's called their um, 401k. And if that's not sufficient, it'll be taken out of their social security. So it does create a level of accountability that never existed before. And so members felt that they could do um, those acts with impunity. So, so you kept this non-public for many, many years. And in fact, you even ran for Congress. And if I understand it right, the man who did this won that seat in Congress. Um, and it was short lived or he wasn't there for long. Um, why? So, so what prevented you from going public then and what makes you feel compelled to, to talk about it now? So he actually didn't win the seat. He became the Democratic nominee and gotcha. in a fluke, it was the Republican who won and served for a short period of time. I just never think a Republican in the Bay Area. I, I forgot know. that used to happen. Yes, yes. So, uh, and the reason, well, at the time, you know, it wasn't even called sexual harassment back then, right? So we're talking 77, 78. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and, you know, I had gone on with my life and it was a one-time event, but um, I told it when I did because we were in the middle of the Me Too movement. Um, I saw an opportunity to clean up um, Congress and so um, wanted to uh, make sure that uh, those who had been sexually harassed or assaulted knew that I too had and that um, I wanted to fix it. All right, just two more questions and then please people weigh in with your questions. We're starting to get some come in. Um, th this, um, the Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution, which essentially just says you can't discriminate on the basis of gender and that women have to be treated the same as men. This is something which was proposed and passed by Congress in the 70s, but not right. enough states ratified it. So you've reintroduced this so that the states can then amend the constitution? So what happened, 72, it was passed, it was bipartisan. Um, it then went to the states and 35 states ratified it. Um, but they had put a deadline in it. You know, I say there's no deadline to equality, but paternalistic Congress at the time put a deadline uh, that it had to be passed by. So then they came back and they extended the deadline. So, um, but then no further states had actually ratified it. So we were stuck at 35. Then very recently, the states of Nevada, Illinois and Virginia did ratify the ERA. And as such, we should be there at a point where the archivist just certifies it. But with this deadline kind of um, hanging over us, um, I introduced a resolution that would strike the deadline from the preamble of the amendment so that it would be clear. And that passed the house in um, last year. Um, and then of course, wasn't taken up by Mitch McConnell, but now we have the sweet spot where we, we have the, the house and the Senate right now. And this is an opportunity for us to move forward. President Biden has said this is a priority for him, uh, and so has Vice President um, Harris. So I'm I'm hopeful. It's only um, depending on if you um, count the section one and section two. We're talking about 52 words. And Antonin Scalia said it best when he was asked the question. He said he was the Supreme Court justice who said certainly um, the Constitution does not require discrimination based on sex. The only question is, does it prohibit it? It does not. So we have case after case where there's pregnancy discrimination, wage discrimination, um, violence against women situations where in fact um, it was um, not successful because basically the court said Congress doesn't have the authority to um, 
to create those opportunities to file lawsuits under the Violence Against Women Act. So for all of those kinds of cases, um, it's time. I see your dog walking behind you. She <laughs> looks lovely. It's times like this that I miss having a dog. Boy, I'm jealous. Um, so I, I'm so um, for students, um, um, some questions are posting up. Some of them are anonymous. I'm going to favor those that aren't anonymous so that the Congresswoman can actually see uh, who you are. We're going to go to Karina first. Um, and so we're going to put Karina on. And Karina, you might just tell the Congresswoman because she was curious, but maybe what school you're at and maybe where you're interning if you, if, if you care to. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for being with us today. Um, so I'm actually a senior right now at UC San Diego. Um, but I will be doing UCDC in the spring. Um, I haven't gone an internship yet, um, but I was obviously looking at some in public policy. Um, so um, yeah, thank you so much again. Okay, so go ahead with your question, Karina. Oh yeah, so for my question, um, just a, a piece of advice um, that you would give to women that are thinking of running for public office in the future. Don't let anyone tell you you can't do it. Uh, the only thing you really need is fire in the belly um, a passion to want to serve others and a um, willingness to put yourself out there. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, Kathy, uh, Kathy Vo. Hello? Yep, Hi, you're Kathy. on, Kathy. Hi, nice to meet you. My name is Kathy and I'm a fourth year at UCR studying political science and public service. Um, I'm interning at Congressman Carbajal's office right now and um, interested in immigration law in the future. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing so much of your personal stories with us. Um, you've been a champion and an inspiration for young women like me and I really look looked forward to hearing from you today. Um, I had a very similar question to Karina but it was more of do you have any more specific advice for young girls who aim to hold a congressional position in the future or enact change like you have? And then on a lighter note, um, what have you been doing to pass time during the past year in the pandemic and quarantine? Okay. <laughs> All right. I should probably tell you when I got my internship in Sacramento, I remember driving into the Capitol in that beautiful white dome and thinking, wow, this is such an exciting place to work. Um, but I never, ever thought I had what it took to run for office. So, um, you know, we all have self-doubts and it's really important to push those self-doubts away and go for it. So when I ran for Congress the first time, I ran for the unexpired term of Congressman Ryans. And I was, you know, there were all these, there were 12 candidates. I was the only woman. My arm was still in a sling because I was still recovering um, and I lost. And I like to tell people that uh, this is what a three-time loser looks like. I lost for student body president in high school. I lost the first time I ran for Congress. And I lost when I ran for Lieutenant Governor of California in 2006, because I wanted to become the first woman Lieutenant Governor. And it took you know, another 10 years uh, or 12 years for us to get our first woman Lieutenant Governor um, who is now serving in that um, particular role. But, uh, you, you just have to put yourself out there. Now, in terms of specifics, uh, getting, I think these internships are great because you're learning a lot. Uh, becoming a staff member for a period of time can be very helpful. We have lots of former staff members who basically jump from being a staff member to running for office. Kevin McCarthy is a great example. He was a staffer to uh, a member of Congress, and then he ran for the state assembly and then ran for Congress after that. So uh, I would encourage you to do that. Um, being involved in your local community, you, you need to know your community because if you want people um, to, to invest in you, um, you can't just come flying in and think that you're going uh, to be able to be successful. Now, having said that, uh, there are individuals who have been able to literally um, come back to a community where they haven't been engaged for a long period of time and, and get elected. Um, but that's not the rule, that's the exception. And killing time during the quarantine, any- oh. uh... <laughs> Killing time during the quarantine. You probably well, have a lot of time to kill, but- No, there really isn't. Uh, I would say that, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time doing Zoom calls. 
Um, and uh, I have given uh, as Christmas gifts to one of my best friends and to my son, one of those um, uh, ellipticals that you can actually use while you're sitting in and doing your Zoom to get some exercise. I need one of those because uh, I, I do spend a lot of time on Zoom. Um, and, you know, occasionally get to go out for dinner if it's outside, at least when we were in the red zone um, versus the purple zone. But um, it, I think it's been a tough year for everybody and staying healthy and, and playing by the rules has been really important. So I've tried to do that. Okay, I'm gonna uh, read one of the anonymous. I'd rather you guys uh, ask these questions because I don't want to, but I'm gonna read one. Um, thank you so much for being with us here today. It's incredible to listen to you. How do you heal and become an effective lawmaker, which you are, when you experienced highly publicized political, politicized trauma, especially when certain politicians played down some insurrection, sexual assault, and so I think what they're getting is when you hear other politicians say sexual assault is not that big a deal or the insurrection is something that's not impeachable. How, how as somebody who's been harmed by these things, do you react and handle that in a professional way? I think in my um, entire career, um, I have um, always just made sure that the facts supported what I was trying to do. And recognize that um, I have a big megaphone. When I got to the state legislature, I worked a lot on child support enforcement because um, at the time it was called the feminization of poverty. The only people in poverty in this country were um, women with children. And it had a lot to do with the fact that child support orders that were made by the court were not being enforced. So I carried a lot of legislation in that regard, not because I had, um, been um, impacted by it, but because I just saw it as a, an injustice. And so you don't necessarily have to be impacted by issues in order to find that um, it's, there's an injustice. So um, I carried a lot of legislation in that regard. And it was after no fault divorce was created in California, which was really something that benefited men more than women. Uh, when no fault divorce went into place, uh, men's standard of living jumped and women's standard of living declined. So I'll just tell you this funny story. One of the, um, the bills that I had um, signed into law was one that said, if you have a, a professional license in the state and you're not paying your child support, uh, you can lose your license. So the first victim of that law was a, um, a doctor in San Diego who owed over $100,000 in child support. And it wasn't until he almost lost his license to practice that he made good on developing a plan for a repayment of the child support that had been ordered by the court. So um, the other, I've worked on sexual assault in the military for a long time. And it was like an issue that was swept under the rug. And I started telling these stories on the house floor and what are called you know, five minute opportunities. And they're graphic and they're horrendous. And I must have told 30 stories, but over time it's taken almost 10 years, but now the military realizes it's got a problem and it needs to fix it. Do you get treated uh, in California? People are used to women at the highest levels of office, except for governor, but you know, two female senators for years and years until Senator Padilla came along and Bay Area has had mayors and representatives of women for many years. But there are some places that have never sent a, women, a woman to Congress. You deal, you're on the Armed Services Committee and you deal with military people a lot, which is certainly a male culture. Do you find as a, as a woman lawmaker that you are treated any differently? Well, you know, the military has a, um, you know, there certainly is kind of a, um, you know, maybe an in, unintentional bias, but there, you know, there clearly is a bias that exists. And, and that's why some of these issues don't get addressed. I mean, I've had, um, I just got off a call, a Zoom call of a, a, a really talented um, army. Um, uh, I think I'm trying to remember what her status is, but I mean, she's, she was an, an officer who was trying to go on to another, but she got pregnant. And then all of a sudden she was kind of, you know, shut aside, it was a, a form of pregnancy discrimination that we wouldn't tolerate in the private sector. Um, 
So, you know, there is, I think, um, maybe an unintentional bias in some respects. Um, I will say that, um, you know, we all need to recognize that, um, uh, you know, there's, there's an old guard and a newer guard. What's kind of interesting is we have many more women serving on the Armed Services Committee now, and, and a number of them have served in the military um, as officers. Um, one's been a former CIA agent. So uh, I think they're all um, showing that, that they have what it takes. And I, I think for some of um, the, the Pentagon brass that may have looked, um, you know, at me as, as just being a problem, uh, once they read my biography and know that I was shot five times and left for dead, they, they give me a little cred ability there, I guess. But, um, you know, it's a process. You have to show that you've got what it takes and that you're not going to take no for an answer. You, you did have a story, which maybe you can uh, just tell um, and hear about a lawmaker who, when you were talking about guns, said something about you oh. in a condescending way about, do you have a gun? Do you want, do you want to just quickly recount that story? Yeah, this, so it was when I was in the state assembly and we were taking up the assault weapon ban and Dave Roberti, who was the Senate pro tem, was the author of the legislation. And he asked me to be um, the, what's called the jockey on the assembly side. So I'm presenting the bill. And then one of my colleagues um, who will remain nameless, um, who was a, a, a former sheriff uh, in um, Sacramento, um, raised his mic and said, well, the gentle lady yield. And I said, well, of course I'll yield. Um, he says, Miss Spear, have you ever shot an assault weapon? And he said it again. Have you ever shot an assault weapon? As if to say, if you haven't shot an assault weapon, how can you possibly be carrying legislation to ban it? And I thought to myself, did you just come out from under a rock? And I thought to myself, if you're stupid enough to ask me that question, uh, then I'm going to give it right back to you. And so I said, no, I have not. But assembly member, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been shot by an assault weapon? And the whole um, assembly chamber went silent. He sat down and uh, one of his colleagues said, good job, Ted, as if you remember <laughs> Ted Baxter from the Mary Tyler Moore show who always said stupid things. Um, he was uh, um, kind of giving him a hard time. Now that bill flew off the assembly floor and got signed into law by a Republican governor, Pete Wilson. So that was at a time in um, not the, that far distant past when Republicans and Democrats could see the benefit of banning assault weapons. Okay, um, Michael, you have a question. Yes, I'm not sure if you can hear me or. or yeah, I can. can hear you, and maybe okay. just uh, explain uh, where you're, uh, where you're a student. And absolutely, uh, I'm a senior at UCLA, um, and I spent the last uh, year doing various research programs about tech. Um, so I'm also from the Bay Area as well, but first and foremost, I just want to thank you for sharing your time and thank you for your service as well. Um, but I wanted to ask primarily, um, knowing the history of social change, particularly in the Bay Area, and also um, my, my question concerns the growth of online hate groups who ironically also oppose the protest of social movements like BLM. So my question is, how can tech companies in the Bay Area, um, even though many of them employ less than black and uh, less than 5% black and brown workers and even less women, how can they support social movements and discourage the growth of online extremism? It's a very good question. And I would say that if you look at most of these tech companies, they're populated by young people and you have a whole lot more clout than, than you think you have. Um, you might remember when uh, Google was uh, offended that one of their big uh, officers had um, had some sweetheart deal. He, he'd been a sexual harasser and they finally um, gave him a, a huge package and let him go. And they all went out strike. Men and women left Google that day during lunchtime and said, you know, we're not going to take this. So I think that um, what we have found is that the, these platforms are, um, have been irresponsible 
they have basically um, given the impression that they're, they're just a, a public square. They're just uh, giving us a platform for a public square. They're not just a public square. Mm -hmm. um, they have algorithms that will you know, generate a certain amount of content to you based on uh, what you will click on. Um, the longer they can keep your eyeballs on a certain page means there's a greater likelihood that you'll see their advertising. And that's what you know, runs these companies. So um, there's a section in the F's, um, in the, I think I'm trying to remember what the, what the uh, act is called, uh, is section 230, which basically has absolved um, all of these social media, media companies of any kind of liability. And both President Trump and many Democrats feel that that section has to be changed. So um, I do think that uh, we have to ha expect a certain level of responsibility, um, that we can allow hate groups to be able to use that platform for their benefit, um, and that they need to be shut down. Give a lot of credit to Jack Dorsey, who has shut down Donald Trump's uh, Twitter account indefinitely, I guess, or permanently, um, because of the you know tens of thousands of lies that he would spew out and um, the actions that he uh, generated on January 6th. So um, I think it's the Federal Decency Act, Section 230, uh, that needs to be amended. And we've just got to create greater accountability for um, the various platforms and tech companies. Thank you so much. I took a lot of notes there as well. So I really appreciate it. And you're welcome. Well, let's go to uh, Sophia and, um, and Jonathan after that. I'm going to turn the lights on because it's getting dark here. So I'll, I'm listening to the platform. It is dark here. I always get jealous when I see California at this hour. Great. Okay, go um, ahead. Hi, uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yes, I do. I can hear you. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us and for being so open about your experiences. And I am a senior at your alma mater, UC Davis, yeah. and Go I'm Aggies. also studying political science. Great. Um, and my question is, I'm wondering how you're able to deal with gridlock in Congress. Um, from where I'm sitting, it seems quite fr frustrating at all levels of government. How do you reconcile this difficult process of passing legislation with the desire to make progress? And do things ever seem just totally hopeless? Well, I'm an optimist, Sophia, so I won't go to hopeless, but I will tell you that I was pretty shocked when I got to Congress after spending eight years in the state legislature where um, every bill had a hearing. And if you could convince a majority of that committee, the bill moved on and uh, through the process. And, you know, bills get introduced to die in Congress. It's, um, it's, it's a very, um, I think, ill-conceived system that we have created over centuries now um, that does not make for um, the kind of uh, swift progress that we want on certain issues. Um, now, every once in a while, uh, you know, there's a, there's a shining example. Um, the, the George Floyd Policing Act is a great example where, you know, his horrific death um, really created an opening to pass legislation that had been sitting around for a long time and not getting any results. And, you know, we were able to do something around um, the, the congressional Me Too problem because that issue had percolated up. So you, you have to look at opportunities and, and take them when you can. Um, and sometimes, you know, you have to spend years and years trying to get legislation through. So. Uh, unfortunately, it is the nature of the process in, uh, in Washington, and uh, I've just stuck with it in hopes that um, we would, would see success after a period of time. The state legislature is a much more satisfying uh, experience in terms of getting legislation passed and signed into law. So that relates Thank you so much to- for your insight. Sorry. No, that's, that's fine. Uh, we have an anonymous question too that relates to this. It asks, um, uh, and Jonathan, I'll get to you in one second. Uh, it says, I know you're in the house, but do you have a position on the filibuster in the Senate? Oh, yeah. you know, that goes precisely to one of the, the issues, right? 
uh, yeah, the, the filibuster should long have been uh, put to rest. And um, yeah, I'm a big proponent of doing that. Um, so we've got to convince a couple of, of Democrats to, to get us there, but uh, okay. yes, it's time. Jonathan, go right ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, Hi, Jonathan. Hi, Congresswoman. First off, just thank you for uh, taking the time today to speak with us. It's been really an insightful workshop and just thank you for your openness about your experience. Uh, my question for you was, um, what does being a UC alumni, oh, a UC alumni uh, is for you? What, did someone in the administration ask you to ask Mike that question? <laughs> uh, no, I actually know um, a little bit about myself, and I forgot to mention that uh, I'm a fourth year um, uh, econ student at UC Riverside, and I'm a first generation college student, and the word alumni is often thrown, off, um, thrown, um, thrown around a lot. However, like the word alumni is new to me, so I always like asking that question to learn, you know, what, what does an alumni mean? And, kind of want to know, uh, know what being a UC alumni means to you. So Jonathan, um, you and I are very similar. I was the first in my family to go to college as well. And um, back then, you know, you didn't go on college tours. You, you went where your parents told you to go. And they wanted me to go to UC Davis because it wasn't as radical as UC Berkeley. Um, and so that's where I went. Um, I got rejected from Stanford and accepted to UC Davis. And so uh, that was the experience. I will tell you that you will appreciate the fact that you have had a, a top-notch education throughout your life. I have uh, Genentech in my district, and it's you know the the um, inventor of biotech, and the CEO of the company who has since passed, but was a friend at one point. Um, I had gone to visit him, and I said, "So, um, you know, tell me." Uh, what, what can I do in, in the state legislature to help you? Uh, and I assumed he was gonna say, oh, well, extend the research and, um, and development tax credit. He didn't say that at all. What he said was, um, keep the integrity and quality of the UC system, um, first and foremost, because he had joined forces with Herb Boyer, who was a professor I believe at Berkeley, and that's how they founded Genentech, which became the first biotech company in the world. Um, so uh, we have we have done well by uh, all the alums that have graduated from UCs. Uh, we have also done well for uh, the country and the world in terms of the remarkable research that's gone on at um, UC institutions. So um, be very proud of your education and. Um, that you see moniker that you'll always have. Thank you for that answer. I really do appreciate it. You're welcome. Good luck to you. Thank you. Okay, Lauren, and then Sochita after Lauren. Hi, good, uh, good evening, Congresswoman Sp uh, Spear. I yes, have yeah. two Hi, questions. Uh, Mark, do you have a preference if I just ask one of them? No, go ahead, go ahead. Just to right. talk. I'll just answer it quickly. How's that? Great, thank you. Um, so my first question is, uh, as someone who's pursuing law school and uh, hopefully afterwards the judge advocate program in the Marine Corps, I'm interested to know your strategies in uh, sort of, of appealing to those in the armed services who deny uh, sexual assault rates or sexual assault allegations, maybe say that they're a way of uh, quicker promotions and, and things like that. And your second question? And the second question would be, um, as a champion of the Me Too movement and as a representative in a public office, uh, I know that you've likely been on both sides of cancel culture and of a lot of online hatred. And so I'm interested to hear your takes on whether or not you see cancel culture as a positive or negative force on social media and as a force on society at large. So to your first question, um, I'm delighted that you want to go into law and that you would like to, is it the Marines you said you wanted to, to join as a, a member of the Judge Advocate Corps? Um, yes, that's correct. We need, uh, we need talent in those roles. Uh, I would say that uh, over the last 10 years, there's, there's been great movement within the military in terms of recognizing that what they're doing isn't enough. I mean, we've now spent close to a billion dollars over the last 10 years with all these programs to deal with sexual assault. 
and they haven't worked. And there was a horrible um, murder at Fort Hood uh, very recently. It's called Vanessa Guillen was the young woman who went into a, an arms room and um, a, another a soldier there um, killed her and then um, dismembered her and uh, buried her in a remote location. And um, it, it, um, it's really captured uh, the interests of Republicans for the first time. For the longest time, Republicans would not support um, this issue of taking these cases out of the chain of command and putting them in a separate office within uh, the military uh, because they didn't want to offend uh, you know, the, the brass. Um, that's changing. So um, having really solid uh, attorneys within the military is, is critical. Uh, and we probably need to change the way that we um, have them rotate in and out um, as quickly as we do. In terms of your second question about um, Me Too and cancel culture, um, I, I think our last president did such a huge disservice um, to us as a nation um, and really encouraged uh, hatred and, um, you know, I'm I'm the victim of all kinds of online abuse. Um, many uh, women, frankly, more women in politics are uh, victims of that than men. Um, and uh, during the last election, I, I tried to get Facebook to recognize that once uh, then uh, Vice President Biden as our nominee was going to select a woman, we knew he was gonna select a woman. I knew that there was going to be uh, a lot of hatred and vitriol uh, online. And sure enough, um, there was, and I had urged Facebook and Sheryl Sandberg in particular to, to try and get that off and they were ill-equipped to do it. So um, I would say that, you know, the cancel culture can be taken um, frankly to an extreme. I, I'm not pleased with what the San Francisco Board of um, Education is doing about um, you know, taking Abraham Lincoln's name off of one of the high schools, for instance, or Diane Feinstein's name off of a school. I, I think we uh, can, in fact, go too far. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good luck to you. Thank you. So, Chita, and I'm afraid this is likely to be our last question as the hour is flying by. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Sachita. I go to the University of California, Riverside, and I'm majoring in liberal studies and history. And so my question to you is, given the Democrats control in both the Senate and House, what do you hope to accomplish or like legislation you hope to pass, given that you have both control? So I learned uh, from uh, the mistakes we made uh, the first time I was in Congress when we had both houses, when Barack Obama was president and for two years we had both houses. And we did pass the Affordable Care Act uh, uh, with re reconciliation, uh, but we, we weren't able to move as fast on so many other issues. So um, the fact that President Biden um, has lived it he knows that we have a short window of time. We've got, you know, a, probably six months to get really important pieces of legislation through both houses and then signed by him. So the uh, American Rescue Act that we are trying to push forward by March 14th with $1.9 trillion in it um, is an effort to keep uh, Americans afloat, help small businesses stay alive um, and, uh, get us through this pandemic. So most of these benefits will be in place until September 30th. Uh, beyond that, a massive infrastructure bill is really important for us um, to get through. Uh, getting the minimum wage increased, whether it's in this package or as an independent bill, you know, it hasn't been increased in like 10 years. The value of um, the minimum wage now is like $16,000 less than it was 10 years ago because we haven't had it um, going up appropriately. I want the ERA to be passed and signed into uh, law as well. Um, and I think that getting a, um, a, an assault weapon ban again uh, 
passed by Congress and certainly getting background checks, which um, is the law in this country, except for the fact that there are loopholes for internet sales and um, for uh, those that happen at, at uh, gun shows. That if we can get that package through, I would feel like we have done um, the, the work for the American people that we said we were gonna do. Congresswoman, uh, thank you. Uh, like all the students have said, we appreciate your time. Um, you know, when you were a senior, I was just thinking at Davis, there were only about a dozen women total in the House of Representatives. So hearing from a Congresswoman would have been extremely difficult, still a major minority, but obviously it, it, it's much different uh, than it was. Um, to, to the students, next week we actually have another, we have a member of Congress, just got to go south down the coast by 150 miles and Salud Carbajal will be here. Um, so it'll be a, a, a different you will set. Enjoy, of, you will tr truly enjoy uh, Salud. Yes. Um, um, and, and, and again, thank you. We will try to get you a UCDC mug that you can put on your desk. Thank you. And, uh, and thank you for uh, the interns that you have taken in in the past, and I'm sure you will in the future. Thanks, Congresswoman. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mike. Thank you to all the students. And, you know, just live that dream. Do not let anyone tell you you can't, because, um, you know, we are sometimes our own naysayers. Don't let that be your case. Great. Bye-bye.